in your courts. In, in the quietness of the morning, we come asking, asking you for an infilling of your Holy Spirit. In Luke eleven thirteen, you said that if we be know how to give good gifts, how much more does our Heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So this morning we come asking for the infilling of your Holy Spirit. We ask, Lord, that you will consecrate our hearts and our minds. So as we listen to your words this morning, it won't fall on deaf ears and they will transform our lives. We ask, Lord, that others will see the change in our lives and not only see the change, but they too will want to taste of your goodness. So Father, we ask that you will just be with us as we sojourn through this wilderness, wilderness of war. Many of us have our challenges and we ask Lord that you will supply your needs according to your riches in glory. Many of us are going through the various issues post COVID or even during COVID, I say post because the cave and island is relatively free from COVID. But I know in other parts of the world, we are having challenges with COVID. So we just pray, God, that you would just, each of us, as we do the various battles, whether it be financially, sickness, emotionally, spiritually, we ask, Lord, that you will just visit whatever our situations are. And we ask, Lord, that when we have seen a change in our lives, or even if we don't see that, we will always remember to praise you because you're worthy of all the praise and the glory. So we ask, Lord, that you will continue to be with us. And I pray that you will be with my sister right now. She presents. We ask, Lord, that you will speak through her as she speaks to us. And at the end of this, may we be blessed. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. We ask your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Justine, so much for getting up so early. I know there's a time difference. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, uh, Sister Cheryl, for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this program. Now, as was mentioned before, this is not something that I would normally do. I am not one who likes to be in the limelight. Um, people would think otherwise, but I am one who prefers to be in the background. But, you know, when you are asked to do something for the Lord, it's always good to be used by him. Now this morning we have a profound reading titled An Unmistakable Difference. It is quite profound. When I was reading it, I was very challenged to take an introspective look at myself and my life and my activities. And I hope that by sharing this with you, you will be forced to do the same. So, an unmistakable difference. As one reads the book of Acts, what that stands out above all others, the church grew phenomenally and immediately after the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit took charge of the work of God and thousands were converted to Jesus Christ. Such tremendous growth caused some problems. For example, Acts chapter six tells us that some of the widows were neglected in the daily administrations. So the Holy Spirit led the 12 disciples to call a meeting of believers. They decided that seven deacons were to be chosen. Their qualifications were simple. They were to be men of good reputation, full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom. Such qualifications must have been observable in order for them to be used as guidelines. Hence, the qualification of being filled with the Holy Spirit must have been observable as well. But, you know, we may argue, isn't every believer filled with the Holy Spirit at baptism? Apparently not. Otherwise, the qualification of the Holy Spirit for the position of deacon would not have been used here. It would have been redundant. For example, if one were choosing men for a job and all men had blue eyes, it would be redundant to tell someone that the men must have blue eyes. The experience of the Samaritan believers seems to verify the fact that not all believers 
had been filled with the Holy Spirit at their water baptism. In Acts 6, we read that when Philip baptized a number of men and women, the disciples in Jerusalem heard about it and sent Peter and John to Samaria. Luke records what happens next. In Acts chapter 8, verses 5, 15 to 17, we are told, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. So in the selection of the seven deacons, men who were not known to be filled with the Holy Spirit were not selected. Hence, being filled with the Holy Spirit was something distinct and observable. What then you may ask is this observable difference? It seemed that these spirit-filled men had developed a reputation among the believers. The qualification of honest would appear to indicate that perhaps these men were living exemplary, victorious lives under the power of the Holy Spirit. Their being asked to serve might indicate that under the filling of the Holy Spirit, their lives were a great blessing to others. Their lives were perhaps more of a blessing than those believers who did not have the filling of the Holy Spirit. According to Dwight L. Moody, God has not a good many children who have just barely got life, but no power for service. The Holy Ghost coming upon them with this power is distinct and separate from conversion. If the scripture doesn't teach, I'm ready to correct it, but I believe we should accomplish more in one week than we should in years if we only had this fresh baptism. Paul indicates that this infilling of the Holy Spirit is something that we can lose. Let me repeat that. Paul indicates that the infilling of the Holy Spirit is something that we can lose. And Paul instructed the Ephesians in Ephesians 6 verse 18 when he says, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Greek form used here filled is a continuous action verb. Paul instructed the believers to continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Every day, every day, one must ask God to fill them with the Spirit. It is a promise we must keep claiming in order to keep receiving. Perhaps God established this principle of receiving the Spirit so we could continue to be conscious of our daily need to be filled anew. A Spirit-filled church is made up of spirit-filled Christians. And I will repeat that a spirit-filled church is made up of spirit-filled Christians. Let's consider for a moment what a spirit-filled church is not. Revelation 3 describes God's last day church and he uses the word lukewarm to describe her. Lukewarm and spirit-filled are not compatible at all. A believer is either spirit-filled or lukewarm. The parable of the 10 virgin also supports this truth. The wise virgins who were ready to meet the bridegroom had extra oil. This oil refers to the baptism or the infilling of the Holy Spirit. According to Ellen White, the name foolish virgins rep represents the character of those who do not have the genuine heart work wrought by the Holy Spirit. The coming of Christ does not change the foolish virgins into wise. The state of the church represented by the foolish virgins is also spoken of as the state of the Laodicean church. Leroy Froome, in his book, The Coming of the Comforter on page 294, comments on the foolish virgins. Listen to this, he says, the foolish virgins think that the wise ones are unduly worked up over the question of oil. They can't understand why these virgins are so worked up. Observing what happened in the early church in the book of Acts and comparing that to the church today, I am forced to admit that the Christian church is not spirit-filled today. 
I am also forced to admit that the Seventh-day Adventist church is not spirit-filled today either. Does that mean God is not using the church to carry on his work? Absolutely not. It simply means that there is so much more that God could accomplish through us if we were as spirit-filled as he desires us to be. I think statistics verify the spiritual state of the Christian church. The majority of the members and even the pastors take very little time for personal prayer and devotions. Most Christians will try to be present for church services on Sabbath, but that's not it. Prayer meeting, which is said to be the barometer of spirituality in the church is either non-existent or attended by very few. Do such facts describe a spirit-filled church? I think not. It has been said, and you know, brethren, I found this quote very, very profound. It says, if the Holy Spirit were withdrawn today, the majority of the work of the church would continue as usual, and most of the church members wouldn't even know he left. As a Christian, I have to admit that it is easy to get so busy in the work of God that one begins to do his own planning, his own thing, and giving no consideration as to whether the planning and doing are under the promptings of the Holy Spirit. I'm afraid that much of our activity in the church is as a result of man's plans and efforts and not those of the Spirit. What are Spirit-filled Christians like, you may ask? The Bible gives us a few descriptions. Peter is a clear example of before and after. Before Peter received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, on the day of Pentecost, he was weak, fearful, and operated in his own strength. Just a few weeks before Pentecost, he denied the Lord three times. However, after he received the infilling of the Holy Spirit, he was a different man. A powerful change took place deep within him. In Acts 4, we read of the Jewish leaders threatening Peter and order him not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But having been filled with the Spirit, now instead of cowering under the pressure and being afraid, Peter and John answered, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Paul's appearance and public speaking was not as polished and appealing as Apollos. We are told that his speech was contemptible and his bodily appearance was weak. On numerous occasions, the brethren shunned Paul. However, Paul understood and had experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The results of his ministry are described with the words, and all that which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus both Jews and Greeks. Perhaps one reason we often hesitate to seek the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our lives is because the Holy Spirit moves in unpredictable way. Many of us like things going in one simple way. The early church didn't seem to mind this. They had no buildings or facilities. There was not much organization. However, in Acts 2, we are told that 3,000 joined the church, and in Acts 4, 5,000, even though they had no deacons. I think if such things began happening today, many people would become easy, uneasy. I know this from personal experience because church members I have seen reacted negatively when the spirit was clearly moving. The problem was that the spirit was not moving in the way they had expected. Spirit-filled Christians will stir Satan's anger. We see clear examples of his efforts to hinder the spirits moving in the experience of the apostles after Pentecost. Nevertheless, spirit-filled ministry will have amazing results. What appears to man's eyes as a little will amount to much when it is done under the spirit-filled power. Much effort performed in the wisdom and strength of man or woman who is not spirit-filled will amount to little. The stories told 
of a young couple named David and Sevilla Flood from Sweden who went with their two-year-old son to serve as missionaries in Africa. They went with another family called the Ericsons. They felt that God had called them to go to Africa, to this remote nation to evangelize. So they set up in this town of Nadora and they were rejected by the chief. They ran them out. Um, so they were forced to go up into the mountain to build a little hut. However, it so happened that the villagers allowed a boy to bring them food and chickens and eggs twice a week. This boy was the only contact they had with the villagers. So Sevilla Flood decided to tell this little boy about Jesus and God blessed her efforts and the boy accepted Jesus as his savior. It so happened that Sevilla got pregnant, gave birth to a daughter named Ana. The delivery was exhausting, Sevilla got malaria, her condition worsened and she eventually died 17 days later. Her husband became so discouraged. He dug a grave, buried his wife, decided to return to his homeland and gave his baby to the Ericsons. It so happened that the Ericsons themselves became, became sick and they both died within eight months. The baby was given to another missionary family and her name was changed to Aggie. Aggie grew up, got married and she met a man called Dewey Hurst. The couple served the Lord, had two children, did ministry. It so happened that Sevilla came across this photo of a grave with a white cross and she saw the name Sevilla Flood. She rushed to a member who she knew could speak Swedish and asked the member to interpret it. The story was told of this missionary couple who had this baby girl who, you know, she died. This happened to be the very Aggie. Aggie was so touched. She decided that she wanted to meet these people. She ended up going to Africa and would you believe it, the very same village that rejected her parents had now had 600 Christian believers. Even the chief was now a believer because the little boy who Sevilla had spoken to had become a Christian and he in turn had started to evangelize in his village and led all these people to Christianity. It so happened that Sevilla went to her mother's grave and she prayed and thanked God that even though she didn't meet her mother, even though her mother died, as a result of her mother's effort, these very people who rejected her had now come to understand who God was and had been converted to Christianity. And as a footnote, Aggie got to meet her father, David Flood, who had this time was very bitter towards God. However, as a result of Aggie's visit, he renewed his relationship with God and experienced peace and resurrendered re his heart to God before he died. Brothers and sisters, this is the power of the Holy Spirit. He does not work in predictable ways. Who would have thought that even after this couple's death, the little boy would be able through the spirit to transform this many people. May each of us be willing to yield 100% to God withholding nothing. If we in sincere faith ask God for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he will give us what we desire. Then our lives will be a great blessing to others and the result of our service for God will reach into eternity. Let us stop thinking about what we want. Let us start surrendering to the Holy Spirit. It's not about us. It's about God and too many times we think that we have to be in control. We have to be able to predict. We have to develop the outcomes. It is not about us, it's about God. And the minute we surrender to the Holy Spirit, we would be amazed to see how our church is transformed. The question is, do we want a transformed church? Do we really want to do God's work? Do we really want to evangelize or are we comfortable with doing things the way we have been doing them all this time? There's a quote that's saying, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results is 
tantamount to idiocy, right? If we want a transformed life, we need to submit to the working of the Holy Spirit. And I can guarantee that the way he worked back in the day of Pentecost is the same way he will work today. So I implore you, brothers and sisters, all who are online, submit to the working of the Holy Spirit and let him amaze you with what he can do in your life and what he will do through you for his church at large. I'm going to play this song and I hope by as you listen to this song, listen to the words and ask God to transform your life.
thank you so much, Sister Ellis. That's another of my sister's people. Um, so thank you so much. The Holy Spirit wants to lead us. He wants to make an observable difference in our lives. Do we want that observable difference to be in our lives? I implore you as you pray this morning, pray and ask God to give you this infilling of the Holy Spirit that your life will be different and not only different, but observably different to others. Thank you so much for listening. Amen. Amen. What a profound, profound devotion this morning. I have been truly blessed. Tears have come to my eyes. Okay, so it didn't come right out, but it came to my eyes. And honestly, it just made me realize that it's important to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So right now we are going to go into our breakout rooms to pray for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We, have, we will have 10 minutes and we want as many people in the group to pray for the same reason. We are storming the gates of heaven this, this morning and we know that the Holy Spirit will fill each one of us on this platform today. So, Brother Winter, you're going to break us up? 